Hello, hello, hello. How you guys doing out there? I'm Constance Carter, and uh, I am a black woman with a PhD, a public high school diploma. Give it up. <laughs> and uh, I'm super proud about that because uh, a lot of the things that I've been able to accomplish, I'm a, a CEO of the largest African-American owned real estate firm in California, and I'm an investor, and I've made some really great, I've had some really great accomplishments, but it's been done primarily because uh, of God. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today without, without him. The other thing is I hang out with some really, really smart people. Like, I am not the smartest tool in the show. I hang out with some really great people. I'm also a fervent learner, so I'm always at somebody's workshop, training, uh, some type of conference. But the thing that I do most, one of the things that's most that I, I, I run to very, very often is the power of the internet. Anybody ever heard of Google University? Well, that's where I got my PhD. I call it GTS. Does anybody know what GTS is? Google that shit. <laughs> so every time I, I need to figure out something, any time that I need, I'm doing some research on anything or I've built my business by doing GTS, I, you know, if my, if my agents need something or my kids need something, first thing I tell them is to GTS. So what's GTS, y'all? Google that shit. Tell me one more time. Google that shit. All right. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk about a few things. As an investor, I'm going to tell you how to invest, but I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to GTS, all right? So when I was four years old, my mom bought me a Baby Alive doll. Now, this was after months and months of her, me asking her over and over again. Actually, it was probably weeks. It may have been days, but in my four-year-old mind, it was months and months and months. And I remember just as vividly as it was yesterday, she came home with this Toys R Us bag, and she said, I got something for you. And I was so excited. I seen this bag, and I seen this box peeking through, and I opened it up, and I pulled it out, and I was so excited, and I pulled out this doll, and I immediately started to cry. My mom was like, well, what's wrong? This is the Baby Alive doll, the baby alive doll that you wanted. I said, this doll is ugly. I hate it. And she said, well, you asked for this Baby Alive doll. I said, this is ugly. Well, that Baby Alive doll was black. And the one that I wanted, it was white. And somehow in my four-year-old mind, I knew at that age that somehow black was bad. I knew at that age that somehow this black doll was inferior to the white doll. And I don't know how I learned it. It might have been TV. I have no idea. But that was further punctuated and confirmed when I went to elementary school, when I learned about being black. I learned that I was inferior. I learned the only thing that I learned about being black was that we were slaves and that we were oppressed. I learned nothing more. I learned about the struggle of black people. And it wasn't until I got out of high school when I started to, with the power of the internet, and I used Google University, and I started to GTS. Tell me what GTS is again. Google yes. And I learned that we were so much more than that. I learned that there were, we had civilizations, African civilizations, thousands of years before slavery. I learned that there was the, the richest man that ever lived was an African named Mansa Musa. I learned that after uh, the Civil War and after Reconstruction, there were towns that sprawled up all across the United States, all black towns that were prosperous. And there was one in particular. It was, uh, it was uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was so prosperous that it was called Black Wall Street. Now, Tulsa isn't that big, and this was only like 32 square blocks or 35 square blocks, and there were over 600 businesses. And most Americans still don't know about this town to this day. Over 600 businesses, they had grocery stores, they had a bus system, they had law offices, libraries, movie theaters, they even had planes, you guys. And it took the dollar a year to circulate before it actually left the community. And even in the most close-knit communities today, it takes the dollar at least, like in the, in the Asian community, it takes the dollar uh, 30 days to circulate before it leaves the community. In the Jewish community, it takes the dollar 20 days to circulate before it leaves the community. In the white community, it takes a dollar uh, 17 days before it leaves the community. But in the black community today, six hours. And so here you have this community that, that was so prosperous and it was thriving and it was during a time that it was most dangerous to be black in America. 
Look up Red Summer, GTS that. It's when the black people were, were lynched at record numbers. And, and even in this small town, as they did all across the towns all over the country, they bombed it and they burned it down because they were jealous. And not only did they do that, but they went in and they stole the people's things from their houses. And they, they would say things like, well, how did this end have more than what we have? And then I read in an article just a few years ago, uh, I gts it said by the year 2053, that median black income was going to be a zero. And not far after that, Hispanic income was going to be a zero as well. And I thought to myself, I'm like, well, how is it that nearly 100 years after such a prosperous time as Black Wall Street, are we here where we're headed to a zero? How is that? And I, have these, I do these lectures all over the country, and I talk to my friends, and, and, and I ask this very question. And some of the things that I hear is black people, we like to wear our wealth. We like to have Gucci belts, nice shoes. We like to buy the most expensive cars. And while that's true in some cases, that's not by and large the entire case. There are things that have happened, systemic laws that were put into place that, that created this, this wealth gap. Right after Black Wall Street was destroyed in about 1935, uh, the federal government said, we are going to make home ownership a possibility for everyone from all walks of life. Everyone except people of color. So they came out with this FHA home loan that was supposed to be accessible to everybody, and they, but they didn't allow African Americans, Hispanics, or other people of color to take part in that. So 80% of wealth in this country is generated through real estate. Did you know that? 90% of wealth in this country is passed intergenerationally. And so if we're not able to take advantage of these wealth building opportunities, then how are we able to build wealth? And so these laws that were put into place, it, they prevented us from being able to purchase. And if they did give us loans, they gave us predatory loans. And predatory loans is just is, is part of the American fabric, you guys. Wells Fargo was just sued two years ago for offering predatory loans to minorities. So it's very, very common, and it hasn't stopped. But what happened is you had these areas that they subjected uh, people of color to. It's called redlining. I don't know if you know. But if you look at this map here, this is the city that I live in. This is the city of Stockton, right? And in the east part and the south part, these areas were redlined. Now, redlining happened all over the country. These areas in particular were redlined areas. And these, these areas in particular were mostly black and Hispanics lived. And this redlining has far surpassed anything that it did back in the, in the third, because redlining was outlawed in 1968. But it far surpassed that because even today, these communities don't have any real, real economies. There's no big box stores. There's no major retailers. You won't see a Walmart in sight. But what you will see are some check cashing places, some liquor stores, some payday loans, and some churches but no, really, no real contribution into the, the, the communities. So if you, we don't have an opportunity to build wealth, well, then how, do you, how are we supposed to close the wealth gap? Well, let me share a couple of ways, because I am an investor. And I'm going to show you a few ways, at least four ways, that you could, things that you can invest in so that you can close the wealth gap. Because I don't really believe what Forbes said. I don't believe that has to be our story. I believe not only can we close the wealth gap, but we could exceed it. So number one, the first investment we have to start making is we have to invest in real estate. Now, I'm super proud that even with the systemic issues that we've had, over 40% of Hispanic and black households are homeowners, even with the predatory loans, even with the fallout of the foreclosure market, over 40% of us are homeowners. So that's not bad considering there were laws putting us in place, put in place for, that prevented us from owning homes but over 75 to 80% of our white counterparts are. So we can close the wealth gap. So again, 80% of wealth in this country is generated through real estate. Now, I own one of the largest African-American-owned real estate firms in California. And the reason why we are so successful is because we're not just putting people in homes. We're not just saying, hey, we're just gonna sell you a home, we're gonna sell somebody else a home, we're gonna sell. We actually sit down with you and help you develop a wealth plan. What does that mean? We're saying, okay, we're gonna put you in a home. In the next three to five years, we're gonna help you to start creating your wealth portfolio. So not only are we gonna put you in a home, we're gonna help you to, uh, to, to start purchasing multi-unit properties, and then possibly apartment buildings. And then we're gonna buy the block. 
So we do things like, like credit parties, where we show people how to increase their credit and use it as leverage to start building wealth. It's called OPM. Does anybody know what OPM is? Other people's money, absolutely right. So we show them how to use OPM so that they can start building wealth. And just yesterday, you guys, no, no joke, one of my clients called me the other day, somebody that I put on a wealth plan, and she said, Constance, I'm ready to buy my next home. Now, this was a young single mother. She had bought her first home a few years ago, and then she had used the leverage and the equity from that home and bought another home, a multi-unit, and then she used the equity and the leverage from that home, and she bought another home. That was another multi-unit. Now she's ready to buy her fourth property, which is another multi-unit. So now she's up to eight units. Single mother. This is the type of thing that we do for pe our people. And it's so important that we're utilizing real estate because again, 80% of the wealth in this country is generated through real estate. The second thing that we need to do to start investing in guys is we need to start investing in stock, okay? Another one of the reasons why the wealth gap is so wide is because when, when people of color do invest, they only invest in real estate, but they're not investing in stock. They're scared. We are scared because we think it's like gambling. We're scared to, you know, put our money in it. And of course, you know, the market, the, the, the stock market does like this. The other day, I saw on Facebook just yesterday, they were like, hey, the stock market is on sale. Let's buy, 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 right? So we need to start doing this. And I did, a, I did a, uh, an experiment uh, a few years ago with my kids. These are my kids up there. Aren't they beautiful? So this was a few years ago. And uh, I, told, I, I bought the Dr. Boyce Walk in Stock program. And I call it the parable of the talents. And I told all my kids, I said, I'm going to give you $1,000 a piece if you take the stock program and you start investing in stock. So the only one that did it at all four of my kids is my oldest son, Duders, the one with the little circle and the arrow. So this kid was so excited. I gave him this $1,000. He opened up a Meritrade account, and he took that $1,000, and he made $8,000. You know how he did that? GTS. He Googled everything. Now, if a 12-year-old child could utilize Google to take a $1,000 investment and make $8,000, why can't we adults? The information is out there. Just the other day, now my son is on uh, Robin Hood. And he told me, you know, because he's investing in Robinhood. So he told me the other day, he said, Ma, I just made uh, $480 on penny stocks in one day. And so we don't need a whole bunch of money to start investing. You can start investing pennies, dollars, a couple of, you know, $50, $25, $100. Just start investing. And not only that, teach your children how to invest. The third thing we need to invest in is ourselves. We need to be more vigilant about opening our own businesses. Guys, sometimes God has placed something on the inside of you and you're scared to step out there on faith. Right now is the best time that you could start investing in yourself. Listen, COVID, if COVID hasn't taught you anything, it should have taught you that you cannot depend on your job. It should have told you that you have to have multiple revenue streams. 42% of this economy is made up of small businesses. And it's made up of people who are willing to take the risk to jump out there and, and, and do that in spite of their fears. Now, right now is the best time, I promise you, in the history of this country, in the history of this world. You know why? Because we got the internet. We can do whatever we want to do. We can be whoever we want to be. We don't have to worry about things like discrimination because I don't got to be a black woman. I can be anybody. I can sell any product. I can do anything that I want via the power of the internet. You ain't gotta worry about high startup costs. You could just do it. Be like Nike, just do it, and don't wait for it to be perfect. Don't wait for perfection. There's a saying that says, beta now, better later. Perfect it as you go. And the fourth investment, and my final investment that we need to start doing, is we have to invest in our children. These areas these red line areas are still affected, like I said, today. City of Stockton is where I live. It was the epicenter of the foreclosure market. They filed bankruptcy. But one of the biggest things for Stockton is they have the lowest literacy rates in, in California. And these are reflective of that. These test scores are reflective of the, the lack of investment in these communities. Think about this. We spend $32 billion more on affluent schools than we do on impoverished schools meaning we spend $32 billion more 
on white schools than we do for children of color. And the test scores reflect that. Black and brown kids aren't inherently dumber. White kids aren't inherently smarter. They just have access to more resources. Now, Judy talked about those, those, the ways that we could, we could uh, help these children and the things that we have to do differently. But we need to have the resources. Each state in this country, we spend more money on prisoners than we do on pupils. Imagine if we broke the mold and we changed, turned that around and we spent that money on pupils and not on prisoners. What would it do for the economy? It would take the burden off the prison systems, that's for sure. I'm from the Silicon Valley originally, and over 72% of the tech employees are from other countries. And it's great that America is just such a great company that any country that anybody could come in and have opportunities and build wealth. That's a beautiful thing. But why don't we do the same thing for our babies? Why don't we invest in them so that they can have those opportunities? So again, listen, four things you could do to start investing so that we can close the wealth gap. And I believe it's possible. I, don't, I do not prescribe to what Forbes said about us being at a zero in the year 2053. Number one, invest in real estate. 80% of wealth is generated in real estate. Two, invest in the stock market. Today, right now, I want you to go to your apps, download Acorns, download Robinhood, and start investing today. Three, invest in yourself. You are your biggest commodity. You are your biggest investor. And number four, invest in our babies. Because when we invest in the life of a child, it helps the community, it changes the economy, and the whole country is better because of it. And if there's anything that I said that you're not familiar with, I challenge you all to GTS. All right, I'll see you later. I'm Constance.